Welcome, welcome all to uh, our event today for remembrance in honor of Steve Green. My name is Miles Whitney. I'm a professor emeritus uh, of sociology and social work here at MCLA, but probably more relevant, uh, I am a uh, longtime friend and colleague of Steve Green, and I'll serve as the master of ceremonies today. We're here today to remember and celebrate the life of Steve Green. And I want to uh, express the gratitude of the family who is all there. <laughs> and uh, for, for, your, for your presence and for those people who are uh, watching this on Zoom as well. So I'm sure it's uh, heartwarming to see so many uh, familiar faces and uh, so many people that uh, uh, knew Steve and there's probably uh, many more. Uh, every part of this program will honor Steve's life. We'll hear tributes and stories and we'll likely have uh, moments of laughter and others of tears, all because our lives were made better because Steve was, was, was with us. I'd like to offer a few, couple of personal comments before we begin with the introduction of the speakers. Uh, Steve was my friend. With our wives and daughters and our friends at the college, we have had uh, countless dinners and picnics and outings most recently, uh, my wife Margaret and I uh, met for weekly breakfast with uh, Sue and Steve and often other people as well, and uh, we enjoyed that immensely. Um, Steve was my colleague. I have had countless talks with Steve about teaching, about students, about our department, about issues at the college, his community work and mine were quite different, but we talked to each other about the community a lot, and we served as sounding boards for each other. I'm a very lucky man to have had Steve as a friend and a colleague for the past 47 years. We haven't missed a year at all. I miss him each and every day. Now it's time to um, move to our uh, speakers. And uh, the first speaker is Mary Grant. <clears throat> Mary Grant has a long history with Steve and the family and that she was a student here, sociology major, we want you to know, and, <laughs> and, uh, and uh, while she was a student, um, she babysat for Steve and Sue's children, and they've done very well. <laughs> so, uh, and she, you know, graduated from uh, then uh, North Adams State and went on to grad school and other jobs and lo and behold came back as president of MCLA and um, was uh, again very much involved with Steve which I'm sure she'll she'll address um, she's the to this day she's the only graduate of North Adams State MCLA that has become president of the college. And uh, <laughs> we'll probably get some more at some point. So without further ado, Mary Grant. Thank you, Miles. Um, yay, sociology. Really, really nice and um, and I think Julie and Caroline turned out okay. So I, I take full responsibility and credit for that. 
But thank you, Miles. Thank you, Jamie. Um, really wonderful to be here with all of you. And actually, Jim and I spent many years in this very space with Steve. There was always a core group of deeply devoted fans and lots of, lots of bleacher seat uh, coaching going on here or at the athletic fields as we cheered on our trailblazers. Steve was at the center of that core, which meant that no matter when you arrived, there was always a seat waiting for you. You could get caught up very quickly on what was going on and on all the stats and particularly all the unfair calls that had been made by refs that clearly left their glasses and their good judgment at home. There was no doubt about that. And I was also very convinced that our smart students rigged the 50-50 raffle because it seemed that at every single game, either Steve or Jim would hit the jackpot and at that very same game, all that money would be turned back into the students to go right back into the athletic fund. So I think those students knew what they were doing. I've known Steve for almost 45 years. He was my teacher, he was my mentor, he was my friend, and he was also my trusted and wisest colleague. It's quite rare when one person occupies that role all at one time. As my most trusted and wisest of colleagues, he was also still my mentor, still my teacher, and most importantly, my friend. After I graduated from North Adams State College and moved back to Boston, Steve stayed in touch. He did that with so many of his students. It was really his superpower, staying in touch with people. I have notes and cards that Steve took the time to write and send. We all write notes, but Steve actually sent them. And now those notes and cards are even more special and treasured. And I've developed the habit of writing notes and cards to people that I meet along the way. As a matter of fact, a member of my team from MassArt was at an event last week in Boston, and the executive director said to her, I got the loveliest handwritten note from your president. And I said to myself, thank you, Steve. And now I can also tell you that my handwriting now rivals Steve's in terms of legibility. So um, there's only so much value if you can't read the note. When Steve and Sue and Caroline and Julie would come to Boston, we always had dinner, something that Jim and I looked forward to all the time. And year over year, we would pick up right where we left off, and we got to watch Julie and Caroline grow into brilliant, funny, gutsy, kind women as they headed off to DC and Nashville. We had a few meals in Nashville and in DC, and our Boston dinners continued with so much fun as those seats at the table were lovingly and more loudly filled by Lenny and Nancy. We also had countless dinners and world problem solving sessions at Steve and Sue's dining room table, on their back porch, or at Gramercy Bistro in any one of their many locations. And no matter where we were, our time always began with a ritual between Steve and Jim that would end with, I'll have what he's having. It was pretty simple. They should have just started there. When Steve came to our house, we figured out pretty quickly, it was never really about us. It was always about our dogs. It was always about our dogs. And they knew what we knew, that he was a very soft touch and that one day this great human would be destined to have a dog of his own. And 20 years after I graduated from this institution, I had the privilege to return to the Berkshires as president of MCLA. And I remember early on someone asking me, what's the biggest difference between when you were a student and now? And I said, well, I have keys to everything now. They didn't give those to me when I was a student. Um, and with my keys in hand, I returned to this institution that changed my life, working with a deeply committed staff and a truly devoted faculty. And many of those same faculty were here to greet me when I returned, and they were eagerly waiting to grade me, yet in a different role, and they did. And shortly after my arrival, we needed a new provost, and I asked Steve if he would be willing to step into this role on an interim basis. He did so without hesitation. Steve, my teacher, my mentor, and my friend, was willing to do whatever he could do to support me to help strengthen MCLA and deepen our connections with his beloved North Adams, and most importantly, create the conditions of success for our students. 
When I watched him in action, I thought, why would I look elsewhere when I have the best possible person in this job? Steve served with distinction as provost until his retirement, working with a great team and an extraordinary faculty and staff and board members. We got a lot done with the help of wonderful partners like Dan Bosley and John Barrett. We built buildings, we modernized buildings, we bought a rectory, we opened a gallery, we replaced soccer fields, we renovated residence halls, and much more. But more than anything else, it was the work to open the doors of the institution wide to the next generation of students that mattered the most to Steve. And upon his retirement, he was embedded in the advancement office, where he continued writing notes, reaching out, staying in touch with alumni and faculty alike. He and Miles led the effort to establish a faculty emeriti group. And frankly, Sue, that was a little retirement gift to you because we knew that after 40 years of walking to the office every day, he needed a place to go. Some of you may be shocked to realize that Steve was not a man who readily embraced the tools of technology of the 20th century, <laughs> let alone the 21st century. In his role as provost, we bought him this really strange thing called a cell phone. And he assured me that he carried it with him everywhere. And that was a true statement because he always told the truth. But the only catch, and this was the truth, he never took it out of its cellophane package. <laughs> never, ever. Until one day Sue convinced him, Steve, you really need a phone. And I have a very vivid memory of one fall semester at opening breakfast. The room had quieted down as we were about to begin the program and a phone started ringing. And of all people, it was Steve's phone. <laughs> I think it was the only time he had it turned on. And he walked away from the crowd over to the windows, looking out his back to the room. And he said, um, you know, I'm in a meeting right now, which we all knew because we were right there with him. <laughs> and so I leaned into the mic and I said, Steve, Steve, whenever you're ready, we can get started. <laughs> And he turned around and he looked at me and he held his finger up like this and he said, I'll have to call you back. And he sat down and we got started and it was priceless because it was Steve. Steve was also our weather widget. We would make decisions about whether we were going to open or close based on whether Steve could walk to the college. We very rarely closed because he always made it in, much to the disappointment of our students. He was our emotional barometer he was our community connector. He was our faculty guide, our student champion, and our truth teller. And he was all those things all at once. I have four decades of stories about Steve. They'll keep me going for a while. What a beautiful gift from such a beautiful guy. At commencement, I usually remind graduates of the importance of doing ordinary things extraordinarily well. That was Steve. And he did them with a kind heart, a gentle and self-effacing humor, a fierce sense of loyalty, and a commitment to the long haul by rolling up his sleeves, literally and figuratively, to get the job done and do it well. When I think of Steve, I'm reminded of the wisdom of the philosopher Immanuel Kant and the rules for happiness. Have something to do, have someone to love, have something to hope for. Steve had all of those. He always had something to do to make a difference to fill a life with purpose. And he had love, that's for certain. Sue, Julie, Caroline, Bill, Zeke, Leanne, Corinne, Cosima, Camille, his brothers, his friends, his students, and of course, Charlie, his dog. And our dogs were right. This great human was destined to have his own dog someday. And he had hope, hope for a better future, a future where no one would go hungry, where communities would thrive and connect, where neighbors were neighborly, where students would succeed, and where fair play and kindness were the predominant values. And he always, always hoped for the winning basket, the tie-breaking goal, or the double that would lead to the slide across home plate. To paraphrase the Irish poet, John Adana, let us not look for Steve only in memory, where we would grow lonely without him. But let us find him in the present, beside us when beauty brightens, when kindness glows, 
when orchids brighten the earth and the darkest winter has turned to spring. May our grief flower with hope in every heart that loves you. May you continue to inspire us to enter each day with a generous heart to serve the call of courage and love. Until Steve, we see your beautiful face again. Thank you. Now I'd like to introduce Amber Besaw. Amber is the <laughs> Amber is the uh, current executive director of the Northern Berkshire Community Coalition. Um, Steve has she she will know and Al Bashevkin later will know better than I exactly how many years uh, Steve has been associated with that organization, but it's uh, monumental. <laughs> and uh, so I will uh, say once again, welcome Amber and Thank you, Miles. Um, Steve's relationship with us is forever. Um, from the very beginning, that is Steve's. Um, so I was so honored when the family asked me to speak today. Um, when I learned that Steve had passed, I really didn't know what to do. So, because that was Steve, my rock. Um, so I wrote a thank you note because I felt like that's what Steve would do. So I thought today the best thing to do would be to read my thank you note to Steve. Steve, hello friend. I was sad that we missed our last coffee date. I was looking forward to it. I was sad to learn from Sue that you had finally given so much of your heart to those around you that you needed to step away to rest. I can't imagine what it will be like to go to our board meetings and not say good morning to you, to not see you at the neighborlies, or to not serve alongside of you at MLK Day of Service. While I hope to see you someday in the future, I wanted to take a moment to just say thanks. As I think back over the history of NBCC, it's clear that our history is in large part your history and your legacy. Two humble guys at North Adams State College wanting to make a difference in the lives of those around them cooked up the idea to create the Northern Berkshire Health and Human Service Coalition. What a mouthful. <laughs> you helped this small group of people with big ideas find a home on the campus and you set to work. I remember Al's words to me, talk to Steve. He's a great sounding board, a thoughtful friend, and someone you can trust. I'm sure those weren't his exact words, but the sentiments are all true. I'm not sure how you felt when I applied for the ED job. You never told me or made me believe that you were anything but supportive and confident in my abilities. Your phone calls, emails, thank you notes, and coffee meetings are the things I'm most grateful for and will miss the most. Steve, I'm not sure there were any profound moments at times when you said something that I hadn't considered before, yet I'm so grateful for the genuine reminders to keep moving forward and to be kind. It was never lost on you as someone who understood and studied people that the work of NBCC is not easy, but it is always worth doing. You inspired me with your dedication to be someone who shows up and gives of their time to serve others. I think it's amazing to see the impact that you had as you stepped away from this place, leaving so many people feeling the loss of your presence, your personality, your character, and your friendship. Thank you for taking the time to make others feel important and valued. As someone who stepped into some big shoes at NBCC, it's never been lost on me the legacy of hard work and dedication that I inherited. I'm not sure if all first time EDs step into the position with board members who were there at the beginning. I also don't know if there are many boards and organizations that have meetings so full of laughter or camaraderie as we often do. I have genuinely looked forward to our meetings every month to see everyone to talk about what's going on. I know the joke is that our agendas are never short and I am never without a lot to say. Yet after 37 years, you stayed, you listened, and sometimes you were the voice of quiet reason that brought us back to our purpose. There is a part of me that wants to keep writing. 
so I can avoid saying goodbye. Acknowledging that this will be our last conversation. Part of me is laughing because I know this exchange is like so many that we had. Me talking and you listening, patiently. Steve, I really wish we could have met for that last coffee before you left. I wasn't prepared not to see you again. But thank you for not leaving before you needed to. Thank you for walking alongside of me, sharing your wisdom, your grace for others, and most of all, for sharing your gratitude, lifting me up when the challenges felt a bit too heavy or when I needed the gentle reminder that those around me are worth the hard. Steve, rest easy. Enjoy your time with Al Nelson. I'm sure we will run into, into each other again. Be well, my friend. Many of you uh, probably know, uh, but maybe uh, there are probably some that don't know that Steve Green was quite the soccer fan. And uh, he was a particularly uh, supportive of the uh, college soccer team. And uh, I'm not sure if he ever missed a game or not, but he certainly gave it his uh, best to be there as, as much as he could. And, um, but I also want to mention that uh, our next speaker is uh, Ron Shoecraft, who was the soccer coach and for whom the uh, field is named uh, up in the athletic complex. And, but he was also a full-time faculty member for years and years. And uh, I'm sure talked to Steve uh, very, uh, very much. Um, so without further ado, Ron Shoecraft, <laughs> Faculty Emeritus. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. I too would like to thank Sue and the family for the honor and the privilege of being able to speak today. It means a great deal to me, and it means a great deal to my family to be able to do so. In some way, I feel that there's really no need for spoken words today. I look at the number of people who are here Certainly a fair number of people, I'm sure, who are here virtually. That alone stands a testament to who Steve Green was and who he is to each of us. I'd like to ask everyone to take a few seconds and recall and encounter a moment that you had with Steve. No doubt in those recollections, there's a wide range of stories and moments, but most likely they all shared a commonality that was quintessentially Steve Green. That is, those moments were genuine, they were honest, transparent, respectful, and heartfelt. At times, as we've heard, totally serious, at other times, humorous and lighthearted. I'd like to share a few of my moments with Steve with you today. As has been mentioned, Steve was a great supporter of athletics, including men's soccer. And he would stop by my office and celebrate big victories. He'd commiserate tough losses. And every August in preseason time, he would stop by and want to know how the team was coming along. And invariably, for years and years, he would ask for a tryout to join the men's team. So I put him off for quite a few years. So eventually, I said, Steve, okay, I'll conduct my due diligence. I'll get 
a scouting report. I'll get back to you. So Mary had become president, one of his former students, obviously. So I thought, what better person to reach out to to get a scouting report on Steve and his abilities? After all, she had recruited him to her team as VP for Academic Affairs. Now I will tell you, as a coach in any sport, speed is very intriguing. Speed is something you can't teach, you can't coach, but as a coach, you sure can use it as it's very problematic and dangerous for any opponent. So when I was talking with Mary about Steve's athletic abilities, I asked her about Steve's speed. Her response was, quote, Steve's speed is very, very deceptive. <laughs> He's far slower than he appears. <laughs> so now you, you want to talk academic politics. I'm in a conundrum here. I've got a dilemma. I have to tell my boss that it was his boss who put the kibosh on his MCLA men's soccer career. <laughs> Needless to say, Steve and I shared a great laugh that day, one of many we shared over the years. I stated earlier that speaking today was important to both me and my family. Steve watched my family grow up over the years. His influence is ever present in our lives. He had an impact on hundreds, if not thousands of students, one of which is my wife, Diane. Steve is a 1980 graduate in sociology uh, of North Adams State College. Steve was one of her professors and was her advisor. My daughter, Sarah, is a 2009 graduate of MCLA sociology. And actually she had transferred from another school. She had gone like a lot of students away from home, out of state, large school, and really was sort of unhappy. She left school and sort of wandered around for a bit worked, unsure what to do. One day she announced to Diane and myself that she wanted to return to school to MCLA and continue her major in sociology. We were quite thrilled. Of course, the first call I make is to Steve, who was in the corner office, second level of Eldridge at that point. And I set up a meeting for he to meet with myself and my daughter. She recalls he met for about an hour with her and she recalls on the ride home being truly, truly stricken and impressed that a vice president would give her so much time. He pointed her in the right direction to a wonderful faculty in sociology. Miles actually became her advisor. And it was a very impactful moment for her because she was excited to come back and continue her education. She since has achieved her master's degree and has a career and a job she absolutely loves. Even though my son, Ryan, didn't attend MCLA, Steve always followed his college career and through the years continued to ask about how Sarah and Ryan and their families were doing. At home, Diane and I have a favorite picture of Steve, Diane, and myself. It was my first year after retirement from coaching and we were sitting with Steve. And he duly noted that it was the first time that Diane and I had ever sat together at an MCLA men's soccer game. Steve's professional support of me, both as a faculty member and a coach, was constant. His support to all of the coaches and student athletes who played for North Adams and MCLA was unparalleled. The coaches and student athletes revered him. He loved them. They loved him right back. In closing, a few final observations. Steve's decisions, even when you didn't agree, were easier to respect and accept because you knew they were thoughtful and well-considered and could be trusted. Steve didn't do things for accolades. Steve instead did them because it was the right thing to do. Steve never talked to you. Instead, he talked with you. Steve was not going to send that text message. Now I know why, because his phone was never on. <laughs> <laughs> he, 
Instead, he would send a personal handwritten note. Even though there were tens of thousands of actions, big and small, conversations and notes, he had an uncanny way of making you feel like the most important person in the world. And for that, we're all indebted to him. While Steve will surely be missed, he will never be forgotten. There's no doubt that MCLA, the North Adams, greater Berkshire County communities, and the world for that matter, could use a few more Steve Greens. Thank you, Julie, Sue, Caroline, for sharing him with us for so many years. Thank you. Now we'd uh, like to move to a family presenter, and uh, we're going to start with the older brother. Steve was the middle brother, and uh, so we're going to start with the older brother, uh, Chris Green. Chris is also an academic, uh, as is the whole family, and. Uh, taught at uh, McGill University and is an economist. Chris. Thank you for your the chance to say a few words. Thank you very much. Steve was the middle brother in a family of three boys, each approximately one year apart in age. Um, I think we were known in the community and in the school as the Green Boys. We did many things together, including going to the same eight-week summer camp in the White Mountain area of New Hampshire. We each had our own high school sport. Steve was on the swimming team, and he threw the shot put in track and field. We all went into academia, albeit by different routes, and, uh, broad, but broadly into the social sciences. There were differences too. Steve was the only one to serve in the armed forces. His term of service from 1958 to 1960 was a relatively quiet one between the Korean and Vietnam Wars. He was stationed temporarily in Texas and then mainly at Fort Polk in Louisiana where the chief enemies were poisonous snakes and scorpions and likely boredom from repetitive training routines. A valuable learned skill was driving big trucks. When Steve returned from military service, he resumed his education while assisting two city University of New York professors in the study of alcohol and drug addiction, gaining experience in working in an urban community. In subsequent years, Steve was the only one of the three of us to become intimately involved on a very long-term basis with the community beyond the college he served. He lived out his PhD dissertation topic on the sociology of a medium-sized town. Steve was the brother who brought the three of us together each summer in North Adams, both before and particularly after the sale in 2003, following the death of our mother, of the long-term family home in Connecticut. Let me end. The memorial service is justifiable, justifiably a tribute to Steve's long involvement in, his, and his, in and his contributions to both town and gown communities. To these he was dedicated for most of his adult life. In an age of increasing division, discord, and acrimony, Steve was ever the unifier, the problem solver, and the cheerleader. We all sorely miss him. Thank you very much. Next speaker is a colleague of Steve and a sociologist, criminologist, and someone who, uh, along with Steve and I, uh, were involved in the faculty association for many, many years. Lenny took it to uh, uh, 
took it further than anybody else at the college and that he uh, was also a labor leader uh, with the MTA and uh, did, has done a lot of stuff at the state level. So, uh, but he also was the uh, roommate for a while of Steve Green and you could tell which desk was which. <laughs> Very simple. <laughs> Steve's was neat. Lenny's not quite so. <laughs> but Lenny is a uh, colleague of mine for all these years too. And so without further ado, Len Palillo. Wow, um, I'm, I'm used to talking in front of a lot of people, but this is just amazing. And I, this isn't part of my remarks, but thank you so much. I'm so honored to have to do this and thank you. But uh, uh, it's, it's really difficult to say in a few words what Steve meant to me and to this college one of the most important things I've done in my life is to advocate for Steve Green to come to this college. I have said to some of you, maybe you've heard me, I want on my tombstone, he brought Steve Green <laughs> to North Adams State College, now MCLA. I, he came up here for an interview and just was just a remarkable person. Um, and there was a little trouble in the department at the time, but I knew this was the person we needed for this department. So first year faculty member, I don't think people should maybe do this, but I, President Amsler, who this building is named after, lived at Smith House. I said, you know, maybe my two colleagues then didn't want to hire him. I said, we've got to hire this person. I went to Amsler's house, made my case for him. I said, this is the guy that's absolutely right for this college. He listened to me and Steve came here. And I'm so proud of that. And Miles just stole some of my thunder. I, I did sometimes feel sorry for Steve because he had to share an office with me. And uh, as you know, Steve was organized and neat. Me, on the other hand, not so much. Uh, I can remember a time that we were in Bowman Hall and we were in an office that faced the quad and they had set up a microphone. I think it was for commencement or some other ceremony. And you could see people facing the podium could see up into the office. Uh, so Steve, Steve said to me, after it started, uh, that day, before it started, he said, you know, they came up here and they straightened part of the office up so people wouldn't have to look at. Uh, uh, what an incredible colleague Steve was. And together we built just a remarkable and dedicated department, Miles, Sumi, Michelle, Diane, Maynard, all people like Steve who cared about students, each other and the college. I, I'm so proud to have been a member of our department. We had a good thing going, didn't we, Miles? Uh, Steve not only devoted himself to the college, but loved and cherished his family. Sue, Julie, and Carolyn. 
his granddaughters, Leanne, Corrine, Cosima, and his step-granddaughter, Camille. Uh, a little story about Sue and the birth of Carolyn. Little story about that. Got, got to tell this. Steve cared so much about Sue. Sue just wanted to get that baby out. <laughs> she was despondent. Steve said to me, is there anything you can do to maybe help her along? So we decided that I would come up and cook for them. And I made verdura, which is sauteed escarol. Believe it or not, the next day, Sue had Carolyn. <laughs> I, I, I think of Steve as a gift to all of us that knew him. What a role model for those of us in education. I also think of Steve when I try to impart three simple life lessons to my 10 grandchildren. I say to them, I want you to be happy, basically content with who you are and what you do. I want you to always be kind and caring of others. I want you to do, third thing, I want you to do some good for the community and the society. All of these aspirations, Steve exemplified every single one of us. He was happy to be who he was and what he did. He was kind and caring person to everyone he met. Finally, he did so much good for the community, which you'll hear so much more about, and made life better for everyone. Farewell, Steve. I miss you. You were such an important person in my life and always will be. Thank you. So our next speaker will be younger brother, Tom Green. Tom is uh, also an academic at the University of Michigan and uh, in the School of Law, teaching history of law, I, I believe. <laughs> is that right? Okay. Okay. Tom, Tom Green. Steve was born in New York City on the Upper East Side. He was, as you've heard, the middle of three children known as the Green Boys, all of whom were born in a 31-month period to fertile and efficient parents. <laughs> First came Chris, then Steve, then me. We spent our early childhood being wheeled in carriages around Carl Schurz Park until 1942, when, I like to think, at the ages of two to four, we informed our parents that we had had enough of the city. We've got to get out of here. Accordingly, the Green family moved to then bucolic Westport, Connecticut, 
an hour from the city on Long Island Sound, nearly the end point of the commuter run to New York on the New Haven Railroad. Photos of the Green Boys suggest a happy childhood spent mainly in the family's peony garden. Steve, almost invariably smiling, plays a prominent role in these photos. In one, for instance, he is pointing to one or another country on the globe around which the three boys are sitting. He never lost that interest in geography, in the location of countries, mountain ranges, rivers. The Green Boy's mother frequently dressed us in the same outfit, so we appear to be triplets and on friendly terms with one another, which in my memory, we certainly were. Sometimes we had jackets and ties and were all smiles. But in one, we are in overalls and almost scowling, looking like the neighborhood gang, three Clydes in search of their bonnies. In other photos, we are at a Westport beach. Steve would become an expert swimmer who competed successfully in high school and at summer camp. <clears throat> Easily the most amphibious of the three of us. He was also the only one who excelled in the shot put. <clears throat> Steve soon was as tall as his elder, Chris, and of large and muscular frame. In our backyard football scrimmages, Steve was the harder to tackle. Steve was also, for a time, the harder to figure out, at least for me. This despite the fact that he was closer in age. He was the quietest of the three of us, and in my perhaps faulty recall, the least inclined to talk about his schoolwork. Aptitude tests showed that Steve was very bright, but he was somehow less engaged in high school and in need of direction. I think he was especially susceptible to tensions such as there then were on the home front. Steve and I bonded during those years. I found Steve's difficulties very hard to take. Looking back, however, I recognize the importance of the fact that during that same time, <clears throat> Steve often joined our father as part of a community outreach program to help out at the Westport branch of Synanon, a residence for persons recovering from drug addiction. And I think this first intense experience volunteering for social service <clears throat> was both stabilizing and a sign of brighter times to come. Indeed, it was, I think, an entry point for what became a defining feature of Steve's adult life. College years saw the end of the Green Boys as a unit on a daily basis, but we remain close in spirit, if not often in person, as we went our separate ways, especially after Steve left college served in the U.S. Army, and then settled in New York, where he was employed by Gimbel's, worked on a couple of political campaigns, developed his interests in sociology, and undertook a final and very successful dose of college. 
then, like his brothers, on for a doctorate, which allowed our father to register a faux complaint when we were all together in Westport. There are three doctors in the house, he said, and no one can change a bandage. <laughs> Steve and Sue were married at the Westport house in 1971, truly a marriage made in heaven. And they settled in North Adams, close to the White Mountains where the three of us had gone to camp and in the heart of the Berkshires, which he and Sue deeply loved. Steve read about the northern New England region all of his adult life, and he dedicated much of that life not only to teaching and academic administration at the college, but also to community service in the region that he loved. I hardly need tell those at this gathering of Steve's and Sue's contributions to North Adams itself and to Berkshire County more generally. Steve was the one of the green boys who dedicated his life to hands-on social service. His brothers came to understand the extraordinary extent of these endeavors from conversations with Steve at Christmases in Westport and at the Green Brothers and Spouses summertime reunions here in North Adams, came to know of them despite Steve's modesty. We are, of course, immensely proud to be his brothers. Steve was a classic family man, and his family was and remains a classic, tight-knit, three-generation group. They have always been close in many ways, but what strikes me most is the abundance of shared laughter. Sue has a wonderful sense of humor, and Julie and Carolyn were born with deep reserves of hilarity. Steve, I think, deserves his share of credit for this. He was, as I recall, a humorous agent provocateur as a child, and I don't think that trait ever left him. At Green Brothers reunions, Steve and I had many lengthy conversations. These were sometimes serious, but often as not, they were light and humorous. Steve was always ready with wry observations about life at the college, in town, or in the family. A family which was also very much <clears throat> inclusive of sons-in-law Bill and Zeke and granddaughters Leanne, Corinne, and Cosima. Humorous situations, nicely balanced in relation to seriousness about family life, academic work, and social service, were a natural and even necessary part of the joy of living. And Steve, it seems to me, had mastered the art of a joyful and meaningful way of life. Steve was thoughtful, wise, generous, caring, and empathetic. There was an evident and I think wholly admirable continuity among these personal traits and Steve's professional academic interests in sociology especially in the nature of the relationship between the individual and the community, and finally, Steve's own extracurricular activities as community member and community builder. Ruth and I miss Steve terribly, and we empathize with all of you. 
who we know miss him too. Uh, we, our next speaker will be um, Al Bishevkin. Al Bishevkin was the uh, founder and, um, of the Northern Berkshire Community Coalition, which occurred some time back. And uh, actually both uh, Steve and I were around at that time and, and uh, we enjoyed working with uh, Al. Al also uh, taught here um, uh, on a uh, part-time basis for several years, uh, teaching a number of courses in uh, group work and community organization, and uh, was a fine, uh, fine instructor. Uh, so I want to turn it over to Al to uh, give his comments. You're probably wondering, why am I wearing a hat? Steve. <laughs> he always wore a hat. I, it could be cold days, and he was wearing his baseball cap. And I don't have an MCLA cap. I had a Tufts hat. I know. But this is as good as I could do. Um, it's great to hear everybody's remarks. Um, it's um, it's hard to follow what everybody had to say because you've all said what I'm about to say, but I'll say it in a different light. Um, Steve was a big brother, a mentor, a friend, um, and everything I'd want him to be. He was supportive. He was challenging when needed. He was reliable. He was thoughtful. He was a great kibitzer. He loved to kibitz. He loved to schmooze. Um, he was a good storyteller, and we had a lot of fun together. Um, so I'm, I was the original director of the Northern Berkshire Community Coalition, and Steve and Miles were part of our original steering committee and what we did to, to make it work. Um, at the coalition, if there was a project that we were working on that rooted for the underdog, Steve was a champion. He was in front. One of his favorite expressions was, if you can breathe, you're on the team. Our work in local neighborhoods through Northern Berkshire Neighbors and the building of the UNO Community Center had the gift of Steve's presence. At one time, thanks to the Kellogg Foundation, we gave away a ton of money to local community projects that enhanced public health. We called them Public Health Incentive Grants, and Steve and I called them FIGS, P-H-I-G-S, and we had fun with that. Steve never missed a meeting when we were deciding where the money was to go, and I can visualize his yellow pad, his pen, marking down the projects, the amounts they were all receiving. I never needed to take notes, because Steve did. Um, I think the neighborlies were his favorite event. Um, the Neighborlies were an event that um, commemorated the good deeds that people were doing in the community. Um, Mayor Barrett was a big part of that at the beginning. Um, Steve never missed a mayor, uh, Neighborly event, it, um, and we made sure that it fit into his calendar. Before the Neighborlies, Steve would check in with Liz at our office to see how the no nominations were proceeding. And then he would offer group nominations to honor public servants who we often forgot, the EMTs, the fire departments, and others, the highway crews. And we took them for granted, but Steve never took them for granted and wanted to thank people for what they did. During a time when I was getting a little bit of pushback about doing the neighborlies, because it was a lot of work, um, Steve, I brought it up to Steve looked at him, Steve nodded, and the neighborlies continued. <laughs> and after so many years, Steve was right, and thankfully the neighbor, neighborlies continue now, 
and now with his name attached, and what an honor that is. It's a well-deserved honor. Steve was the only president of the Northern Berkshire Community Coalition Board of Directors who fulfilled their term as president when needed. And when needed, he did it again. There's a theme here. Steve was doing whatever he could to ensure that our community building organization was successful. If he needed someone, Steve stepped up. With Miles, Steve ensured that during the formative years as an organization, the coalition had offices and support services at MCLA. They stormed the president's offices and, and insisted that that happen. I don't know if they really stormed it, but they asked. Um, and, and it worked. And we were located, I don't know, maybe for the first five, 10 years um, in, within uh, MCLA and in the townhouses. We had our own little office. It was wonderful. Um, without that early support from the college, I don't think the Northern Berkshire Community Coalition would be here today. I, I really believe that. They published our newsletter. They provided office space. They gave us a phone number. They gave us an address. We were, we were a legitimate organization, and what a great start that was. I could not have done my 29 years working as a director of the Northern Berkshire Community Coalition without Steve's encouragement, his counsel, his willingness to do what needed to be done. He wasn't someone in a meeting when, when a task needed to be done, wouldn't look at you. He, he was willing to look you in the eye and he was willing to say, I'll do it. Um, he sat with me in Kibbeth when I needed someone to talk about something other than what the coalition was doing or what the college was doing. How many of us here have received a handwritten note from Steve? <laughs> um, I wish you could see. I bet you there's about 70% of the people here that have received it. He wrote to congratulate. He wrote to thank. He wrote to keep in touch. Steve was old school. He never typed. Did he ever type? I don't know. I don't think he, I mean, he had people type for him, but he never, he couldn't, I don't think he could type. He was always written a pad, right? With, he was like this. That's how he did it. He had a pad and briefcase in his hand as he went to meetings. He had these papers that were always clipped together neatly. He never used his phone for a meeting, you know, to kind of record when the next meeting was, but he'd go into his briefcase, pull out his paper calendar, um, that always traveled with him in his briefcase, and he wrote it down. Well, he would check to see if he had a conflict, and then he would write it down. Steve rarely drove, took the time to walk to where he was going, so anytime there was a meeting downtown, Steve walked. Um, he dressed well. I can still see him with his tie and jacket and his baseball cap. That was Steve. Um, if you went into his office, his desk, Lenny, this is in contrast to you, his desk had knee piles. I don't ever remember seeing a computer on his desk. I don't know if he had one or not, but, you know, that could be my distorted memory of who he was. He didn't bother with all the technical, technological advances. He, I think he used a calculator to add numbers. That was probably his most advanced, advanced technology. Never used a cell phone. Um, old school Steve had thoughtful answers. He rarely raised his voice. He was attentive to the details that often get overlooked. And I wonder, maybe all that walking downtown and back and downtown and back, it worked like meditation for him. And it helped Steve to be who he was. I'm not sure there was anything important that I wrote for the coalition that Steve didn't see before it was finalized from our 20th to 25th anniversary reports, to our monthly newsletters, to letters I needed to write, to our many reports, Steve would offer his handwritten notes in red and give back to me for my review. The voice of this, of this writing was always mine. He never interfered with that. But he did insist that the proper rules of grammar were followed. You always spell out the dates or you spell out the numbers, you know, and the commas and semicolons, you gotta get those right. There's a lot of folks here, and I'm sure there's a lot of folks wa watching us. And in the middle of all the connections 
that brought all of us here to celebrate Steve's life. Stan Sue, daughters Julie and Caroline, your families. I rarely sat down with Steve, Steve when his family didn't come up. He was so proud of you. Your families, his grandchildren, your pets, he would beam. And he knew and asked about my family, my two boys, my wife, Nancy. The point is, Steve, by example, made a point of the importance of family. So here we are celebrating Steve's life. And of course, he ought to be here with us, but that's not how it works. Steve is with each of us in our own way, cheering us on for the good we bring to the world reminding us that old school gets it done thoughtfully and might be a bit slower, but he won't miss anything. And sending the message that family is front and center. No matter how busy we are, no matter how popular we are, the families that we have are the most important. So along with my coalition pillars, Terry Lewison, Linda Bazilian, Gail Caridi, Al Nelson, and Shirley Davis, all who have passed on, let's keep Steve's legacy alive. Thank you. Okay. Now we come to the uh, portion of our, our program where we uh, are going to um, read the material that's associated with the uh, honorary degree that is going to be bestowed um, for Steve uh, by the MCLA Board of Trustees. So um, there was a group of people who uh, wrote up material uh, to uh, support the um, honorary degree. And so I would ask them to come up. That's, uh, Sumi Colligan, an anthropology uh, professor. We're all retired, <laughs> all emeritus. That's what emeritus means. And um, Michelle Ethier, uh, social work. And then there's two community uh, folks who also, both of these fellows um, have taught uh, at the college and um, one of them in our department, as well as in, in the history department, is Don Pecor, who is uh, very, Don Pecor was a history teacher, very well-known history teacher, well, highly regarded. Your children had Don Pecor, my children had Don Pecor. <laughs> very good uh, teacher, had Drury, and administrator, and Richard Taskin, uh, a, a lawyer, and a person who taught in our, our department as well. They, they will, you guys are gonna read what? Okay, let's see if what's in here. Yes. Okay, so here we go. All right, okay. Okay. Thanks, Lou. So, a tireless advocate for others and the community he loved, Steve Green had a strong desire to serve others. Warm and gracious, he was a great example of one who devotes his life to public service. As he worked tirelessly on behalf of MCLA and his community. Throughout his career at MCLA, Steve's taught some 3,500 students and advised hundreds more. He attended 2,000 campus events and stood uh, at the bleachers cheering for the home team at hundreds of sporting events. He and his wife, Sue Walker, became deeply embedded with many local nonprofits like the Northern Berkshire United Way and the Berkshire Community, Northern Berkshire Community Coalition. They raised two wonderful children, Julie and Caroline. Um, 
Steve won numerous awards for his work and logged tens of thousands of miles, as you've heard, walking the sidewalks of North Adams. Anyone who knew him, however, knows that these figures don't even begin to capture his legacy, one of vision, steady leadership, empathy, and a passion for teaching. In 2009, Beacons and Seeds, the MCLA Alumni Magazine interview, said Green is a, Green said there is a simple reason that he could connect so well with students who struggled. His own first attempt at college had been cut short due to failing grades. In his own words, Steve said that, quote, the fact that I'm a college flunk out has been very valuable to me through the years. I myself wasn't ready for college. I wasn't motivated and I couldn't get myself to study. I've done a lot of advising here and I often saw students who were having similar struggles. I could always understand where they were coming from. Just wanna say how proud I was to have been Steve's criminal defense attorney. <laughs> Thank you. After his first failed attempt at college, it was Green's interest in people that ultimately brought him back to school. After two years in the Army, Steve moved to New York City and got the opportunity to work for the Bureau of Applied Social Research at Columbia University, New York Medical College, and other organizations. Although it paid little, he found the work fascinating. Newly inspired, Green returned to college, attending school full time at night four full courses every semester while working full-time during the day. By 1967, he had entered a doctoral program at the City University of New York. By 1972, he was in his final year as a graduate student teaching fellow at City University. He and his wife, Sue, were expecting their first child, Julie. He applied for teaching positions across New England and secured an interview at the college. Again, in Steve's own words, he said, quote, at my first visit, I just loved it. It was a stunning May day. Everything was in bloom. I loved the close-knit campus, the charming downtown, and the New England beauty. I loved the feel of it, a real community feel. Hired at the instructor level, Steve's career at the college involved many titles, assistant professor, full professor, department chair, academic dean, associate dean of academic support services, and finally, vice president of academic affairs. But in his heart, he always remained first and foremost, a teacher. Steve said that the classroom had always been his first love and that he had always loved teaching. Steve believed that sociology like any liberal arts subject, has something to teach everyone. Steve said he would like to think that students in his classroom not only learn sociological theory and methods, but also more broadly, how to think, how to ask questions, how to understand the world around them. His hope was that they learned how to think about society, the challenges we face, and to approach questions thoughtfully. Steve went on to say that non-thoughtful presentations are everywhere, on television, in magazines, in newspapers. He hoped that students learn from him a way to cut through that noise and to evaluate information critically. This is still so important today. Throughout his career, Steve has been a steady, constant presence throughout campus and the community as a whole at every home soccer and basketball game, at lectures and performances, at student awards and gallery openings, research conferences, and community service days. I'd now like to welcome MCLA President, Dr. James Burge to the podium for the official conferral of the degree.
Steve was characteristically humble about his impact on students. He felt his interactions mattered, even when it was just small talk and catching up. He was so very right about that. He will always be a part of MCLA. This college mattered to him, and Steve mattered and still matters a great deal to us. In recognition of his dedication to the community and his advocacy on behalf of others and for the betterment of the Berkshires, and by the authority vested in me by the Commonwealth of Massachusetts through the Department of Higher Education and the Board of Trustees of Massachusetts College of Liberal Arts, MCLA is proud to confer posthumously upon Steve Green the degree of Doctor of Public Service honoris causa. I'd like to invite Sue, Julie, and Carolyn to the podium to accept the honor and to share some memories about Steve. <laughs> what? Yeah, that's it. <laughs> okay, who was that man we were talking about? <laughs> um, uh, I just want to say that, that um, I knew him better than anybody, and he wasn't really a saint. <laughs> <laughs> In spite of everything you've heard, <laughs> he's a good guy, but you know, <laughs> he, was, he was a human, that's right. So um, what we're going to do is kind of like a little Oprah Winfrey thing. We're going to sit here and we're going to tell you some stories about that we have about him. Um, and they probably won't be, they'll be quite unlike what you've been hearing. So, <laughs> um, okay. Am I starting? Okay. Um, oh, that's right. Okay, the first night. The first night that we came to North Adams, we had driven up here from Manhattan, New York, uh, where some of the stories were about people getting thrown off the top of buildings, <laughs> and as we prepared to go to sleep that night, we turned the radio on to listen to the news, and we heard Dateline, North Adams. Mrs. So-and-so uh, suffered burns, serious burns on her arm from a grease fire in her kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> and then the second one was that we're celebrating the um, retirement of Father Timothy Shampoo. <laughs> so um, we felt like we had arrived in heaven. <laughs> and this is true. Um, okay. Um, yeah, okay. Carolyn has a story that 
uh, kind of predates our knowledge of C. Yeah, I'll share a story um, from dad's early years before any of us appeared in his life when he was um, in the army and he was stationed in Louisiana and he was this, you know, group of, he was part of a group of like, I don't know, three or four Jewish guys from New York and kind of everybody else was Southern, Southern boys. Um, and so one day they, they look at their schedule and coming up is inspection, which they are just terrified of. They don't want to have inspection. Inspection is the worst thing to have because variably you flunk inspection, then you have kitchen patrol or whatever. Anyway, so they need to get out of inspection. And so one of his, um, one of his buds from New York is like, hey, Steve, hey, Steve, let's just make up a Jewish holiday. These guys will never know. And so sure enough, dad with this other, you know, these other couple guys are like, hey, hey, Sarge, we can't do inspection on Thursday because it's Harkva. <laughs> <laughs> and Sarge is like, oh, hey, hey, I don't want to step on any toes. You guys have a, have a blessed Harkva. <laughs> and uh, so, so yes, yeah, so we uh, like to celebrate Harkva annually in our family. <laughs> Yeah, um, I'm kicking this off back to Jules, my sis. He loved to tell that story because you all know he just loved to laugh and loved to make people laugh. Um, when I was thinking about my memories of my dad, I have so many of them, but almost invariably the first one that comes to mind because I think it really shaped how I saw him was remembering when I was young and North Adams was a real bustling metropolis, albeit smaller than New York, um, <laughs> with, you know, it, it's grease fires. Um, and on Thursday night, the stores would be open late. And going downtown on Thursday night was this huge treat, and everybody would be down there. And my dad loved to take us downtown. And he, we would, you know, walk in and out of stores, and he would just always engage with everybody he saw. Everybody knew him. He knew everybody. I think it has been said he always made every person feel like they were the most important person that he was talking to. And I was in awe of him. I just, I, th I felt like, hey, I'm a celebrity by extension, right? Like, I'm with this guy. Um, I don't think that my feelings were shared by my younger sister <laughs> by a long shot. She was annoyed. Why can't we just move on here? Um, must we continue to talk? Um, and then kind of an adjacent story is that, that we both kind of shared and had parallels about was that he would often take us to Pops store for candy. Yes, may it rest in peace, Pops, in, in North Adams Institution. And we were allowed to go pick out a piece of candy. And my sister and I both longed for the absolutely worst possible for you sugar-laden candy we could get our hands on. We both desperately wanted the lick -a -maid. If you don't remember what this was, it was little candy sticks that you would dip, dip in sugar powder, of, and Steve Green would not have it. <laughs> this, this, no, no, no. You had to pick chocolate because chocolate was healthy. <laughs> chocolate was also the thing that he wanted to take a bite out of. So, <laughs> so we were forced to share our chocolate with, with my dad. Um, and I still feel like that lick -a is very taboo. So. Um, all right, I'm going to turn it back over to my mom. I'm going to give you that older. Yep. Okay. Yeah, why don't you take that? Um, so there was a period of time during the 80s, particularly, when um, members of the faculty would get together for birthdays or special events. And, and one of the things that, that Steve loved to do was to write um, bogus letters. They were letters that were like, they might refer to a relationship that this person had with, with somebody else or an event that happened or whatever. So um, this one I, I picked because it's quite special. It was 
uh, it was sent to uh, Miles Whitney <laughs> on his 40th birthday. <laughs> And it was sent from Red Auerbach, <laughs> who is, I guess, at that point, the coach of the Celtics. <laughs> okay, he writes, Dear Mr. Whitney, I am sorry to have to inform you that we will not be inviting you to our tryouts this year. <laughs> While your credentials are impressive, we did have in mind some players who are younger. We do like the fact that you apparently play with great intensity, sending us hospital admissions reports and x-rays of your opponents was a novel idea. I do wish you well and would advise you to consider the Knicks. <laughs> They do seem to have some real needs these days. And by the way, a happy 40th to you. <laughs> there were many of these. <laughs> Another area where my dad had a great influence on my life and my sister's life was in music. Um, and I like to share both my parents influenced my life in, in terms of music. I have countless memories of my childhood roller skating around the hardwood floors of our living room, which I cannot believe they let us do. I think we tore those floors to shreds, listening to Linda Ronstadt and Cat Stevens, and that was all courtesy of my mom. My dad had a real great love of classical music, and we would get in the car. My dad was famous for wanting to take long drives always long drives. Yes, Carolyn reminded me that he would say things like, just look at the view. And we were like, we're bored to tears. <laughs> um, but, you know, we would get in the car and he would, you know, he would always put on classical music and often Mozart, Mozart was a favorite, often the Mozart clarinet concerto. The fact that I didn't choose this clarinet is only because I had at least four babysitters who played the flute. So, you know, that was, there was, you know, strong, strong identification there. Um, um, but, you know, he would put on, you know, put on classical music and, uh, and, you know, he loved Mozart in particular, grew to love Mozart operas, again, influenced actually on the Mozart operas by my mother. Um, and, you know, and that really transpired over to me and I, I ended up studying music. My sister and I both majored, majored in music in college um, and, and really just loved music. And I remember as a high school flute player, or as he liked to call me, a flutician, uh, <laughs> a tra trademarked Steve Green phrase, um, he, you know, I, I would often, I'd like to think that he asked me, but I really know the truth. I was a show-offy older daughter. And so I would say, Dad, Dad, I, I'll, I'll perform for you. Let me bring down my music stand and I'll play, play a little performance. So I'd bring down my flute and my music stand and I'd play him some, you know, some bit of whatever it was I was working on. And he, you know, you know would mute the TV and listen to me attentively and very thoughtfully. Um, and then always at the end would applaud with great appreciation. And then he'd say, yes, but can you play Shaboom? <laughs> and the significance of Shaboom in his life, I have no idea. I, it's a question that I now think I w really wish I had asked him. Why, why was it always, yes, but can you play Shaboom? But, but for sure, when Bill and I got married in 2002 and I had to pick a song to dance with with my dad, it was Shaboom. <laughs> Yeah, right, okay. So, all right, we're, we're, we're going to move into the, the, the uh, tougher part of this. Uh, when I had cancer, which was in 1916. 2016. 2016. Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> you look really good. I know. Really good. <laughs> 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 oh, old habits died her. Anyway, um, so uh, it was a really difficult time. Um, uh, he, Steve was really kind of at a loss as to how, how to take care of me or what to do. 
Um, we had we went a couple of months without a, a clear diagnosis, which was very difficult for both of us. Um, we finally got a biopsy that that was useful. Um, but at any rate, one of the my my daughter Carolyn came in, and my daughter Julie came in, and they both helped him to figure out um, how to how to manage things and take care of things. Um, uh, and he did a wonderful job, except that, um, and I was in chemotherapy for about four months. And toward the end, uh, he would, and he would always uh, order out. He liked to order out. For, <laughs> he didn't cook himself a lot. And finally, toward the end, I said, you know, I really miss having vegetables. <laughs> 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 is it possible? You know, you can get them frozen and then you can nuke them. I mean, there's nothing hard about it. Yeah. Um, so, uh, but he was, he was there. He was, he was a good guy. And Julie has a little story about that time. Yeah, this was a hard story, but a, definitely a strong memory when my mom was sick. Um, you know, and, you know, certainly he just kind of had to become become this caregiver but he you know it was just a really painful time for him and he kind of soldiered on through it right and his role was kind of managing appointments and caregiving for my mom and um I came up from DC because she needed to go to Boston for a biopsy and we thought it would be good for me to drive just to kind of make it a little easier and we went to Boston and we came back it was a really really rough uh rough time uh not my most beloved time visiting Boston by a long shot um and we got back and my dad realized that he couldn't find his wedding band and I have never seen him so distraught or terrified as he seemed in that moment. And I just think everything seemed so fragile and the symbolism of not being able to find that wedding band was like, it was devastating to him. And he was in an absolute panic. And I fortunately got struck by those moments. And I hope everyone in the room has had those moments where like you have divine intervention and you realize where something could possibly, that you're missing could possibly be and you will laugh at where it was. I just had this moment because of course, what had my father done since we got home? You know, my dad, he had poured himself a scotch. <laughs> and so I reach my hand into the ice bucket in the freezer and his ring is in there. And I pull it out and I'm like, I found it. I <laughs> and he sobbed. I mean, he j the relief, of having found this precious thing in that moment was so meaningful to him. And I'll just never, I'll just never forget kind of seeing him in that real fragile place, but knowing like just seeing his heart really outside of him in that way. Yeah, I just want to add too that, that I had to have um, a, a dosage of, of medication at 2.30 in the morning. And Steve was lovely about waking me up in a gentle, kind way and making sure that I got my medication and uh, getting back to sleep. Good man. Well, we're not going to end on that note. No, no, we're not ending on that note. <laughs> I'll, I'll wrap things up with a funny story. <laughs> I'll play my role. Um, yeah, so this is a this is a story that we also would would share routinely at at holidays and that sort of thing and it is it is kind of about my dad's response to something that i did um i've got some college friends in the audience that will remember this story um i had my own car i was recently out of college i was here in north adams and i was visiting some friends in portland maine and i drove my car to portland maine with the parking brake on, like the whole time. And so, you know, when you do something idiotic like this, you feel like you have to confess. And so I felt like I had to confess somehow to my dad, you know, the great mechanic, not. Um, 
not at all. Um, so I'm in Portland. I call my dad. I'm like, oh my God, dad, I'm such a goob. I drove the five hours from North Adams to Portland, Maine with the parking brake on. And he said, shit. <laughs> well, <laughs> and I hang up the phone and my friends are like, oh my God, is he mad? And I said, no. He said, shit. Well, and we all just stood there like, oh my god <laughs> like this is my new life philosophy thank you now like when you do something something bad happens you just say shit well <laughs> and um and that's a good recipe for living so i'm leaving you with that and yes i just wanted to say kind of one final thing and then i'll give it back to my mom to wrap up which is it's bizarre that he's not here and i i know that if he was here with us right now and we were all piling on the stories and the accolades he would be saying this isn't about me at all you are all the ones who made my life wonderful and so this isn't about me and so i just want to say that because he was not a guy as we all know who ever loved the spotlight and he just got such deep meaning in life from being connected with wonderful people and so it just means a lot that you're all here and you know that you are here because you loved him but you're also here because he loved you I think that really kind of wraps it up for us. <laughs> but I have to say, I'm I'm so delighted to see every single one of you. I I just it was so funny for me to stand at the doorway, and I I was actually going to try to get my Kleenex to, to have with me, and I couldn't get to my coat because people kept hugging me. <laughs> um, so uh, this he would have loved to be here. So I think we're here in his stead. Um, and I think Miles is, uh, Miles is uh, ending this up with Grandpa something. Miles. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, right, there's um, something that was important to Steve and that was give a damn. And you have that on your bookmark, I think. And um, I think you're gonna read what he wrote about you're, I've got it. Oh, all right. Oh, so, so you don't. Okay. All right. All right. I'll I'll read it. I'll read it. It's in there. It, yeah, it's underneath there. There it is. Okay. What? Get some context for it, like where he wrote, why he wrote this. I don't remember why he wrote this. I think it was. Uh, I think it was a graduation speech. Oh, you think it was a. When you decide to go kind of Did my parents give a graduation <laughs> speech from CLA back in, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. In 1992. Thanks, Lainey. <laughs> <laughs> we have our historians. Okay, so this is what he wrote. In the late 1960s and early 1970s, it was common to find people, particularly young people, wearing political buttons. We signified who we were and what we stood for through the statements that appeared on these buttons. Sometime in that era, I came across a button that summed up what was to me the bottom line and what so many of us stood for and marched for. I don't recall whether I found it while Martin Luther King was alive or after he was assassinated in the spring of 1968. It seemed to me, however, to represent what Reverend King stood for, what he felt, and what he worked so hard to say to all of us. The message is simple enough. Three short words that ask us to care about the world we live in and the people in it. Give a damn. That is the message on the button that I wore most often in those years. Very simple, very basic. What words more easily express the reality of caring about others? Isn't this what Martin Luther King fought for, marched for, spoke out for, 
spent time in jail for and ultimately gave his life for? What better way for us to say no to hypocrisy and self-centeredness than to think about how others are doing and what we can do to make their lives better? What better way can we find to honor the memory of Martin Luther King than to give a damn? Um, And I think Mr. Bosley has some buttons to give out. <laughs> so he's got buttons for you to wear, just like you were one of those students in the 60s and 70s. <laughs> okay. You have a thing. Okay. So that uh, this wraps up our uh, program. And um, I'd like to make just a couple of uh, comments. One is um, obviously sitting here, listening to all these uh, um, testimonies and uh, about Steve Green, it's just very powerful and um, very moving and very well and very thoughtful. So I was very uh, moved by uh, a great many things that were said here today. And uh, I'd like to thank everyone for, uh, for being here to listen and for those who spoke for uh, giving it your best. He deserved it. Um, as you Entered today, you were given a, a bookmark, and it has the "Give a Damn" uh, sentiment on the uh, on the back. When you used, when I first was going into Steve Green's office, and uh, it was he had a um, a sign that was sitting next to his desk, a "Give a Damn," and that was there all the time. Uh, so it's it's a very good uh, connection, and his message to care is one uh, that is uh, very important to him, and it's very important to all of us. Uh, thank you for attending, and invite all persons that are here to join us in the rear of the room for a reception and further conversation. Let's uh, we can share more stories about Steve and um, talk with each other and uh, celebrate his legacy. Um, thank you so much for coming. Okay.